hills and looking at resources that are available uh, now or soon for uh, doing this in your science. So on the agenda for today, we'll do some introductions of the kind of the dream team of people we have from the Pascal Instrument Center and the MT community that are here to uh, talk to you and, and, um, and uh, uh, share uh, how MT works. We'll do an introduction quickly to the SAGE MT program. We'll do a participant survey. We'd really like to gauge uh, where, where attendees in this mini course are coming from and their uh, knowledge base and experience level related to uh, using MT. And then really try to fire up this group with some examples of really impressive science that have been done using primarily MT observations over the last few years. And that'll include uh, a short intro to MT, MT just to make sure everyone's uh, on the same page. Uh, we'll uh, shift over to the group from the Pascal Instrument Center uh, just to get an overview of not only the, the general overview of how the Pascal Instrument Center serves geophysical instrumentation, but specifically what MT instruments are now available and are going to be available in the next few months. We'll get a perspective from uh, Jennifer Wade at the National Science Foundation. And finally, we'll have a panel discussion on uh, how you can integrate MT into your science and how you can propose uh, funding for, uh, uh, propose to uh, do MT with funding agencies for basic research. So we're gonna do introductions now. And for this, what I'd like to do is open it up uh, to the group. I think we've rehearsed the order um, uh, that we'll introduce ourselves starting with uh, Akram. So go ahead, Akram. Uh, thank you everybody for joining in. Uh, my name is Akram Mustafa Najad. I'm a seismologist and, um, and I have been at Pascal for um, the past just about six years. And um, I'm mostly working with data group um, but I've got into MT and some other instruments here as well. Oh, thanks, thanks, Andy. Uh, my name is David Goldack. I'm uh, I joined Pascal about almost two years ago, and I've been involved in uh, magnetolarics since the late 1990s. And my main interest areas are in data processing, the our estimation of Earth response curves, and and uh, instrumentation. Hi everybody. Uh, I'm a I'm Maeva Popoin. I'm a seismologist, and I joined Pascal in early uh, 2020. I'm a software engineer here, and I'm helping with um, the MT effort here at Pascal. So I'm Andy Forsetto. I'm the MT program manager at IRIS. Um, I'm a seismologist by training, but MT was one of the first geophysical methods I learned when I was. Uh, an undergrad about 20 years ago. So it's exciting to be back in this role. Hello, everybody. My name is Justin Sweet. I am a project associate at IRIS based at the Pascal Instrument Center. And like Andy, I am also a seismologist who is um, excited about learning about MT and um, helping to support the program in any way I can. Hi, I'm Jen Wade. I'm a program director at NSF in the Division of Earth Sciences. I'm an igneous geochemist, so I am totally an interloper in this group. And I've never done MT, but I've funded a lot of it. Um, I used to manage the uh, geoprisms program that some of you may be familiar with. In the last year, I've also been uh, working in Antarctic Earth Sciences, so I'm there. Hey, I'm Nimfa Bennington. Um, I'm a volcano seismologist at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, and I'm also the electromagnetic um, advisory committee chair. Uh, primarily, I deal in seismology, but I've done some um, work incorporating MT methods uh, into my research of active volcanic systems. I am Adam Schultz. I'm a professor of geophysics at Oregon State University. Um, MT is one of my primary methods. Since 2006, I've been uh, in charge of mapping the 3D connectivity structure of the Terminus US through Earthscope, NSF, uh, NASA, and uh, and uh, USGS support, and I run a large MT instrument facility in aid of that effort. Hi everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, my name is Peter Shea. I'm also at Oregon State University, an assistant professor. Actually, I'm just past my one year anniversary year, so I'm I'm pretty early in my career. Um, more recently, my focus has been in the field of seismology. 
but I have extensive experience using MT for various um, targets. And so I'm well aware of the, of the power it has um, for the type of work we do. And I'm excited to bring that message to all of you. Thank you. Well, hi, I'm uh, Phil Wanamaker. I'm a research professor at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. Um, I've worked uh, predominantly in empty methods, both standalone and in uh, integrative efforts with other methods uh, in geothermal and orogenic studies with some emphasis on Antarctica. Hi everyone, I'm Chloe Gustafson. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Scripps Oceanography. I just finished my PhD about a year ago and my research primarily focuses on using electromagnetic methods uh, to investigate groundwater systems, both below Antarctica and also below the oceans. And I'm also a member of the Electromagnetic Advisory Committee. Cool. Yep. Hi, I'm Jared Peacock. I work with the USGS, uh, one of a few MT folks there, and I've participated in the development of software for IRIS to archive uh, MT data. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, everybody, for those introductions. So um, moving, moving through the intro a little bit more, um, I just wanted to show one example of, um, I think the, the compelling science benefit of combining uh, MT and seismic observations. So this is an example from a experiment that was funded during EarthScope. Uh, this, these figures are from publication by Long et al. in 2020, showing a co-located uh, transect of uh, temporary broadband seismometer installations, as well as long period MT stations. And what you can see is, um, you know, a, a number of features in both images that when combined, you can start to narrow down your list of potential interpretations. And so I think that there's a lot of opportunity to go, behind, go beyond, um, you know, those, those initial interpretations that start with stare and compare and then move into mineral physics and other realms to really do some exciting uh, joint in inversions and interpretations of data sets that are coincident. So just another example of, I think, some of the, the science potential for uh, integrating these new kinds of observations with uh, an established uh, pool of uh, seismic capabilities. So just to introduce the, the how MT fits into the SAGE facility, so uh, SAGE, uh, as I think most people know, is uh, managed by IRIS, which has operated uh, facilities for the NSF EAR division and others since 1985. Uh, the goal for SAGE MT is to, um, it's support from NSF to obtain new MT equipment, a modern pool of instrumentation, as well as develop uh, software resources and provide user services for uh, portable portable projects which use those instruments. Um, we'll learn a lot more about the instruments from uh, the PIC in their talk, but there's a base pool of new long period systems, as well as a growing pool of wideband systems. Um, we have silver chloride electrodes, those are non-toxic, so they're uh, easier to move around. And uh, those systems also include acquisition and in-field processing software to allow you to uh, get some results in the field and allow you to optimize your uh, deployments. In terms of software, uh, Jared mentioned this, but we are developing um, some new community tools in terms of exchangeable formats, MTH5 and Aurora, which is a uh, open source uh, versioning of MT transfer function processing. And, and that's sort of the starting point for doing inversions and earth analyses using MT uh, time series. And then finally, uh, the, uh, Pascal develops, uh, is developing a series of tools for handling data and metadata uh, and to get that into the IRIS archive. And finally, uh, Sage also supports some training opportunities, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. So uh, we are planning to hold, uh, uh, depending of course on uh, public health uh, situations early next summer, a short course that will take place at New Mexico Tech at the Pascal Instrument Center focused on instrument training and data processing for MT. We're kind of considering it like the USRA short course where it becomes an immersion in uh, using facility resource, understanding methods and instrumentation, and especially the data processing um, elements of using MT data. So 
there's there's goals that are really centered around trying to jumpstart a new user base and get potential users comfortable with this instrumentation so that you feel like you could be successful adding it into a proposal and, uh, and leaning on MT data for a key part of your science. And so there will be support available and we'll have a lot more information about that uh, in the next, uh, in the coming months. And then later in uh, the discussion today, we'll have a panel discussion led by Chloe and myself with a, with a group of panelists that really sort of dig into the issues of how MT can be integrated into experiments and proposals and uh, reflect on uh, what it delivers, uh, particularly when you're thinking about designing and executing an experiment. And that'll be an opportunity to have some, some feedback with this group. So I'll end it there. Uh, and I think we'll move forward to uh, Justin Sweet and the, uh, the user survey. So I'll stop sharing for the moment. Okay, now hopefully you can hear me. Can you all can you all see my window? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So what I want to do is just take a couple minutes before we dig into the meat of today's session to um, to go through some poll questions with with our participants. So if you are tuning in uh, right now, um, if you wouldn't mind bringing go, switching over to your browser window and going back to the page for this session. And you'll know this is the this is the page where you put the button to jump into Zoom. Um, we've got a chat window here that I'll be keeping an eye on. Andy mentioned there's a chat in the Zoom um, room as well that we'll be using. But there's a tab right next to that called polls. So if you tap on that, they'll take you over to a list. I think we've got about nine questions, and I was hoping we could just step through these with everybody online. I, my understanding is that as we answer these, we'll get live feedback that everybody can see. So it'll be kind of an interesting way just to get. Everybody familiar with kind of our audience, uh, what our what our background and experience with MT is, and what our interests include. So, if you all want to dive in and start answering the first question here about career stage, we're curious to know how many of you are early career or um, or have been um, or have been around for for a while. So, if you want to go ahead and submit your vote. I guess I can go ahead and put my video too. Okay, I can see the results updating here. Right now, it looks like it's pretty evenly split. All right. Um, if folk, we don't have to take, we don't have to dwell on the questions too long. So if you, you can just hop right along to the next one. Um, this is asking about your experience with the Pascal Instrument Center. So just curious to know how many folks out there are familiar with the Instrument Center and have actually used its, uh, the facility uh, and the services there before. Justin, are you seeing those results in the polls tab? I am, is that just showing for me or do other people, are you able to see it on your screen as well? I am not able to see it, but I was wondering if you could share uh, it on your, I guess. So can you see it on my screen right now? Because I'm looking right at it on my shared window. It might be might be frozen. Oh, okay. Oh, is it frozen? Well, here, let me try stopping and restarting it. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, sorry about that. No worries. Okay. All right, is that any better? Can you see a little circle here? Yeah. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Awesome, okay. So, um, so I'll jump to the third question, which is, um, questioning about whether folks would be interested in using MT for educational purposes. So I'm gonna say maybe. And I can see those results updating as responses come in. So thank you for everybody who's participating out there. It looks like this one is, um, looks like we've got a majority that are interested in using for educational purposes. That's interesting to see. Okay, um, moving on to the next question. Uh, what is your current research focus? And there are a bunch of options here, so don't forget to scroll down. Um, and I think it's asking you to pick kind of your, like your main research focus. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay. It's like, perhaps not surprisingly, we've got um, a majority of, uh, of earthquake seismologists here, but I do see that um, we've got EM and MT well represented. Some active source folks. Okay. Um, next question is inquiring about the your level of familiarity with MT instrumentation. So we've got a lot of new users here. Almost 40%, not at all familiar. Okay. That's that's really useful information for us to know. So that that's that's really key. Great. Um, we'll hop on to the next one here. Um, your target of investigation. So um, for your research purposes, um, where where have you generally generally worked? Atmosphere, deep earth, somewhere in between. So go ahead and and select an option there. Okay. It's like a lot of crustal folks here today. All right, great. Um, and then I think we just got a couple more here. So question about, um, Experiments using portable MT instruments. Um, would you in, would you potentially include another another type of component? So, inquiring if folks are just pure MT, or if they would consider combining it with passive or active seismic GPS. Okay, so it looks like a strong preference here for MT combined with passive seismic. All right. Jump on to the next one. Um, do you anticipate deploying arrays for extended duration studies more than a few weeks of time um, for, for time varying processes? Okay. Some maybes. All right. And then our final question, what is your level of familiarity with MT datasets and data processing? Okay. Looks like we're more weighted to the not familiar or somewhat familiar side of things. Awesome. Okay, so these poll questions, I'm, I'm, these should be visible, are these visible? Can you all see the results or is it just on my end that I'm able to see them? I don't know if any of the presenters can see updating results on their screens. We can, can see, it. see it. Okay, awesome. Um, this poll will be here and will be running um, for the whole, for, for the duration of today's event, except for the next hour and a half. So if you haven't responded or you wanna go in and update your answer, please feel free to refer back to this page. Again, this is outside the Zoom window. This is um, back on the, on the Pathful site under the polls tab. So thanks everybody for participating. Thanks a lot, Justin. And, and thank you everyone for, um, for weighing in on that survey. Uh, I'd be curious to know for those who put other in terms of uh, research interests, uh, you're welcome to type that in the chat at some point. Uh, just be, we didn't wanna make the questions too, uh, too complicated, but it is really helpful for us to know what potential um, applications or co-applications there are with these instruments. Um, so I think we'll, we'll continue to move on, and our next set of talks are going to be focused around uh, MT science highlights, and um, including our first talk by uh, Chloe Gustafson, which will include an introduction to MT. So, Chloe, uh, whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you, Andy. I'll share my keynote and hit play. Okay, like Andy mentioned, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to MT, uh, especially if anyone's uh, unfamiliar with MT. So to start, the magnetotelluric method is a passive technique that we use for imaging electrical conductivity within Earth's subsurface. And we use naturally occurring electromagnetic fields as our source fields. And we kind of have our higher frequency data that comes from regional and global lightning activity 
And then our lower frequency data, which comes from solar, wind, magnetospheric interactions. And similar to seismic, our higher frequency data is sensitive to shallow features, whereas our lower frequency data is sensitive to deeper features. And just a little cartoon about how the physics of this works. We have our source fields that penetrate down into Earth's subsurface. And these electromagnetic source fields generate secondary and electric and magnetic fields based on conductivity variations within the subsurface. And so with MT instruments, we measure all of these fields. And so we start with a raw time series of electric and magnetic fields. Uh, but in order to say something about the conductivity structures that generated those fields, we need to do some data processing. So first, what we do is a time series analysis to take our time series and move that to a response function. And then for each of our MT stations, we have a response function and we take all those and do a geophysical inversion to get a conductivity model. Uh, so this is uh, similar or analogous to taking dispersion curves and computing a velocity model. Uh, so conductivity is a really useful uh, Earth property to examine, and we'll get into that with the examples today. Uh, but just to whet your appetite a bit, I have this nice plot of electrical conductivity uh, for a variety of Earth materials from Sam or Naif. And here we can see conductivity, which is plotted on a log scale, um, and resistivity, which is just the reciprocal. Um, for a variety of earth materials, we have uh, really large scale variations. So we have differences in materials where marine sediments, for example, are more conductive than oceanic crust. And then within the materials themselves, uh, conductivity variations um, manifest from changes in porosity, temperature, water content, or melt volume. And then for the talk that I will be presenting today, we're gonna to look at water here at the top of the screen. So salty water is a lot more conductive than fresh water, which is more on our resistive side of things. So that's my really brief whirlwind tour of MT, but if you would like a less brief introduction, I highly recommend you check out this introduction to magnetotelurics uh, presented by Martin Unsworth, and you can find this on the IRIS YouTube channel. Okay, so now just getting into MT applications in Antarctica. So MT has been collected in Antarctica um, in a handful of places, uh, but for today's vignette, I'm going to focus on one of those studies where we used MT to look at subglacial hydrology beneath an ice stream. This is work that I did for my PhD, and I've been working on this still for the last couple of years now with all of these collaborators listed to the left. Uh, so we're gonna look at ice streams in particular, just for some motivation. Uh, so here we have a plot of Antarctic ice velocity where the brighter colors represent faster velocities. And ice streams are these concentrated regions of fast flow. And ice streams deliver about 90% of the continental ice from the interior of Antarctica out to its fringes. And what controls that flow, or one of the big modulators of that flow is hydrology uh, at the ice bed. So typically in glaciology, we think about water existing in the form of lakes, rivers and canals right at this ice bed interface or within this thin glacial till layer that's about 10 meters thick. But what my colleagues and I were really interested in was investigating groundwater potentially within these sedimentary basins uh, and seeing if that groundwater is connected to the shallow systems and it, if it could have an impact on ice streaming. So we're just gonna zoom into this survey region uh, here we went to the Willens ice stream and I've, the background color is still ice velocity. It's just now on a gray scale where faster velocities are lighter colors. We focused our two MT surveys at two known shallow hydrologic features. So this first one noted in magenta 
and then blown up. On the right is a subglacial lake outlined in white. And we did an MT survey uh, sort of all around this lake and our MT sites are noted by these white triangles. And then the other survey site we went to was the Willens grounding zone. And if we go back to our main map, we can see that uh, there's this river sort of connecting the lake down to the grounding zone and connecting uh, the waters to the ocean. So we have an ocean cavity on the right side of this line. And then just briefly before I get into our results, I did wanna show you what it looks like to set up an MT station. Uh, so we unpack our gear, we orient our site using a compass, and then we bury the magnetometers and electrodes in the snow. So this is how you would set up any land MT site as well. Uh, here, the only difference is we have to use some special electrode equipment to deal with the high resistivity of the snow. So then you can see in the video, we're plugging everything in and you just leave your instrument out for maybe a night or several days, depending on the frequency content you're interested in. So just getting right to our results on the left, I have some 2D MT inversion results. So these are conductivity models. Uh, for the stations that I've outlined in green for both the lake and the grounding zone survey. We're looking about 10, I mean, five kilometers, excuse me, beneath the ice surface for both of these. And the colors here are now log 10 resistivity. Uh, so the blue region we interpret as, uh, well, this is low resistivity and we interpret this as thick sediments that contain groundwater. And then below that, this more resistive region in yellow, we interpret that as bedrock. And I've just noted sort of our inferred boundary with this white line for both surveys. And if we plot all of our inversions together, uh, we can see that these thick blue, uh, low resistivity sediments are pretty persistent throughout both survey regions. And you'll also notice within these plots uh, that there's this darker blue region within the sediments, and it's sort of sitting towards the bottom of our sediment column. And this is low resistivity. It gets down to about one ohm meter. And we interpret this as being representative of salty groundwater. And so these are the conceptual models that we've come up with for both of our MT surveys, where we have thick sediments that contain groundwater, and that groundwater increases in salinity with depth. Two minutes, and, Chloe. Thank you, Andy. And because our results looked so similar, um, we think that our individual survey results are actually just representative of this broader system of deep groundwater within thick sediments throughout the region. And something that's really cool is that if we um, add in some passive seismic, the idea that there are thick sediments in between our two MT surveys is supported by the passive seismic. So here these dots are locations where we have passive seismic data and they are colored based on their sediment thicknesses, which are on average uh, between like half a kilometer and a kilometer. So really consistent with what we saw with MT. And just to wrap up the groundwater portion of this talk, I just wanna talk briefly about the significance. So if we took this groundwater, if we took the sediments and squeezed all the groundwater out, we would get an equivalent water depth of about 220 to 820 meters. And that's at least an order of magnitude more water than what exists in these shallow systems. And then the salinity gradient uh, is really interesting because it can tell us about how the water actually got there. So the deeper water that is more saline we think is old seawater, whereas the fresher water at the top uh, we infer as being representative of basal melt infiltration. So the fact that we have basal melt infiltrating down a few hundred meters suggests that the deep groundwater is connected to the subglacial or the shallow hydrologic system. And because there is that connection, that means that deep groundwater could play a role in ice streaming. And just lastly, um, this old seawater in the sediments could have implications for the deep biosphere and carbon cycling, which I think is really neat. 
Um, I did want to just briefly um, point your attention to some of the other MT surveys that have been done in this region or just in Antarctica. And I know I've gone over my time, um, but Phil Wanamaker, one of our panelists has done some studies in the Transantarctic Mountains and beneath Mount Erebus. And in the interest of time, I'll just direct you back to the IRIS YouTube page and you can listen to uh, Phil's talk about these, uh, some deeper processes happening beneath the ice in Antarctica. Thanks. So we did have a question come in and Andy, I don't know if you oh, wanna cool. save those till the end or can we put those to, to presenters after their, after their talks? Let's do questions after we've done all three, uh, okay. just to just to make sure that we get get those in in a reasonable amount of time. So um, yeah, feel free to submit questions, everyone, and we will collect and and answer those uh, as we move between different segments in the agenda. Okay. So why don't we why don't we move to our next speaker, uh, Adam Schultz, and Adam, I'll give you a, a notice at about six minutes in. Okay, thank you. Let me get the presentation going. and confirm everyone sees it on a, as a full screen. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to give you a, a, a brief as possible overview of the magnetotelluric component of the IMUSH project, which was imaging melt under St. Helens. This was jointly conceived by me and Paul Bedrosian at USGS. And a uh, shout out to Paul and Jared Peacock, as well as Graham Hill, whose work, earlier work was really important in uh, setting the tone for this, as well as uh, Stable Rose Martinez. Um, I'll refer you on the bottom of this cover slide to the Nature Geoscience paper in 2018, where uh, the 3D model I'll discuss appears. And also thanks uh, to the Geoprism program at NSF and the USGS Volcanic Hazards and Mineral Resources Program for support. Uh, IMUSH was a uh, active and passive seismic experiment centered around St. Helens, as well as a wideband MT experiment. Um, all co-registered, the uh, footprint of the wideband MT experiment was, was larger uh, than the, the seismic experiments. And in this uh, station location map on the right, you can see uh, we're in the Southern Washington Cascades. And on the, toward the top right is Mount Rainier, Mark MR. Toward the bottom right, MA is Mount Adams. And uh, MSH toward bottom left is Mount St. Helens. One of the mysteries here is uh, why Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams are not on the main axis of the Cascades arc, but are offset. The little um, green dots are the wideband MT station locations for our project that we installed. Close into Mount St. Helens, you see a lot of orange dots. Those are the previous stations installed by uh, Graham Hill in previous years, uh, type 3D array close in to St. Helens, and then a single profile running from Mount St. Helens to north of Mount Adams. So that was Graham Hill's data set, Cafe MT line uh, run uh, by, by other investigators was also included in our analysis as well as regional um, uh, EarthScope uh, MT transportable array stations. The outline in red here, this big blob is something that had been known about for decades called the Southern Washington Cascades Conductive Anomaly. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss that uh, in, in a moment. Um, what we knew about regional geology, we can go back to the late 1980s, early 1990s. The work of Dal Stanley is particularly important in this. And here we see uh, the geology of this area, this triangle formed by Mount Rainier in the north, Mount St. Helens, and Mount Adams in the south. Uh, and a large portion of that is Quaternary Volcanics and also EOC marine and non-marine sediments. And uh, if we look at this grouping of, of more conductive formations, that big blob I just showed, uh, the Southern Washington Cascades Conductor, uh, by the early 90s, we knew that this was at located depths, depending on where you were, as shallow as a kilometer and as deep as around 10 kilometers, but that was pretty much the level of resolution we have at that point. So MT gave us that general shape of the anomaly and also some bounds on its uh, conductivity or resistivity. It has resistivity of around two to five ohm meters in most locations. And that's more or less coincident with what we'd expect from marine sediments. There was also a bit of seismic reflection data uh, analyzed along anticlines in this area, and an east dipping layer was identified that did seem to correspond to part of the SWCC. Um, and these were 
uh, understood to be largely trapped tertiary marine sediments, and they were brought to the surface by subsequent tectonics. And also, fortunately, there were well logs in the area, and they revealed the ESC marine sandstone and shell, also at depths coincident with this conductive anomaly. So, you know, more or less, the, the consensus view that emerged was the Southern Washington Cascades conductor, though not very well resolved, was most likely predominantly due to marine sediments and metasediments and also other sets of non-marine uh, origin. Okay, um, and looking at, again, the Southern Washington Cascades anomaly footprint on the bottom left of this image, uh, again, you can see Mount St. Helens on the left, Mount Adams on the right, Mount Rainier toward the north of this thing. Um, there's a, a red line through, uh, through it going between St. Helens and Adams, and that's, that represents the vertical profile that's up on top. So this was the early 1990s view of the vertical section through the southern part of the SWCC, uh, and the conductive zone is in, in pink. So that was kind of the, the view of things. Um, most, most likely, again, of a, a predominantly um, marine sediment, metasediment origin. Then what happened is Graham Hill uh, did his high resolution 3D MT, uh, wideband MT work close into St. Helens. And again, with a single profile uh, that went from St. Helens to the north of Mount Adams and did a 3D inversion. And this is a vertical section on the bottom right through his 3D model. And here we see a strong conductor dire directly underneath Mount St. Helens, the black dots are earthquake locations. And then there is this deep crustal conductor that seems to extend from that upwelling zone to a zone that shallows under Mount Adams. And the interpretation then was this may in fact uh, be the Southwest, Southern Washington Cascades conductor, and it may be uh, largely partial melt. Well, that's a completely different view that had been emerging earlier from say Stanley's work. So uh, we, went, oops, we went back there. Uh, you can see this inversion in that Nature Geoscience paper, the Bedrosian et al. I refer to. Um, but what we're looking at here is now all of the data, 295 wide, wide band and long period MT stations from all of these surveys re-inverted uh, in, in 3D. We're doing full, for MT people, we're doing full uh, MT tensor inversions plus tippers. And now we're looking at two different depth maps. So we have a map showing um, to the north, this triangle here, if you can see my cursor is Mount Rainier. Uh, and again, Adam. Mount St. Okay, thank you. Mount St. Helens and off here, Mount Adams. And in the shallow section, three kilometers depth, we see just to the west of St. Helens, I'm uh, sorry, west of Mount Rainier, which is the West Rainier seismic zone, a highly conductive zone. These red bands are highly conductive. Uh, and then to the south, there's a resistive zone between Mount Adams and Mount Rainier. As we go deeper into the crust, seven kilometers, we find that the highly conductive zone is this ring that separates Mount St. Helens on the uh, west, Mount Adams to the east, and then to the north, you have Mount Rainier. And so the southwest, uh, Southern Washington Cascades conductor, which was this big blob, has now, in essence, collapsed. It's this fine ring surrounding this resistive zone. We knew there were there was at least one pluton inside this resistive zone known as the Spirit Lake Pluton, but in fact, um, it's emerged that it's a much larger intrusive. Now we're referring to it as a Spirit Lake Baffolith, and it separates uh, Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams with this big resistive block surrounded by these thin bands of what we interpret to be uh, pre predominantly marine origin sediments and metasediments. Looking at it this way for the final slide, uh, to simplify viewing it, this is not an artist's conception on the left, it's actually the resistivity model, but in the upper seven kilometers, the intermediate resistivities have been um, eliminated and what you're viewing is isosurfaces now. So the, the blue are highly resistive isosurfaces, uh, the orange and reds highly conductive isosurfaces. And we can see on the left, Mount St. Helens just on the edge of the batholith. Mount Adams offset to the east of the batholith, the thin band of what we believe to be the, uh, the highly conductive metasediments and sediments uh, surrounding the batholith and then extending north toward the uh, West Rainier seismic zone. Mount St. Helens seismic zone also lies along this thin conductive band. And we interpret that to be mechanically much weaker than the intrusives and the batholith surrounding it. And that therefore makes it easier for melt to migrate up along that thin conductive band. And we also have imaged uh, highly uh, 
uh, conductive zone in the uh, across below the batholith, uh, or in the artist rendition on the right here, you can see a, a melt source zone uh, welling up beneath the batholith, and then the melt it finds the easiest path of ascent to the east and to the west uh, around the batholith. So that may explain why these two volcanoes are not lying on the volcanic arc. And uh, looking at the petrology and everything else, it looks like it's going to take about a three to ten percent acidic melt source to um, be the, the root cause of all of this as it migrates up. So, uh, long story short, uh, we find that um, using wideband MT to its fullest extent with the latest three D modeling tools, we actually can maintain pretty stunning resolving power in the upper and mid crust, even on this large regional scale. So, this I think is a really good example of the power of uh, wideband MT. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, that's that's a great selling point. Um, so I think uh, if, if anybody has any questions, please uh, chat them in the Zoom chat if you can, and we'll accumulate those and we'll move on to um, Jared Peacock, who's going to talk about geothermal applications of using MT. Okay, uh, yep. So I'll talk about uh, characterizing geothermal with MT, just like Andy said. And so why, why use MT for geothermal? Well, MT is extremely sensitive to where fluids are in the crust or where they have been in the crust. And if you look on the left, this is a similar image to what Chloe was showing, just slightly different. But all the fluids and mineralizations are highly conductive. And if you look at the scale, that's a order of a couple orders of magnitude relative to the host rock. So it's slightly different where in seismic you're looking at a few percent. Here we're looking at orders of magnitude different. So these fluids should highlight quite nicely when exploring for geothermal. And the other reason, as Adam just alluded to, there's different scales that MT can resolve. And this is important because you wanna understand the entire system. Um, the one thing with MT is that we're independent of source location. So slightly different from seismic, we always have energy pretty much everywhere. So looking at the different scales, this is an example from Phil Wanamaker, who if you ever study the basin and range, just look up a Wanamaker paper. Um, but this is a classic and great example of the different scales that you can image with MT. So if you look at the top, we're looking at kind of resource scale. So depths on the order of 10 kilometers or so. And you can see this nice conductive feature coming from deep up into a geothermal system. Then if you go to the middle one, you're looking at kind of resource scale. So now this is about 40 kilometers deep and about you know, 100 kilometers across. And now you're starting to image where the heat source is and where these fluids are coming up. And then if you look deeper, now you're looking at almost continental scale. This is now 75 kilometers deep and a couple hundred kilometers across. So almost looking across the entire basin and range. And you can see these nice conductive features that are interpreted as magnet, magmatic underplating. And these fluids are migrating to the surface through these you know, high angle features. And so there's two main targets for MT when you're imaging, well, when you're trying to image geothermal systems. And one of those is the classic kind of clay cap feature and that's typically found in volcanic systems. Um, this is where you get alteration from fluid movement that creates a clay cap sealing itself. And that is the target for MT. Uh, and as you can see on the right, this is an image of, of this conceptual model where you're seeing the clay cap right at the top and the fluids slightly underneath that. The other target is more of a non-conventional geothermal, and that's where you're looking for hydraulically conductive faults. And this is common in the basin and range. 
where you're trying to find these faults that allow fluids from deeper to migrate towards the surface. And they're a little bit more difficult to find, but they're in there. Uh, and so when you're interpreting MT, it's important to use other geophysical techniques because as you saw in that one of the first slides showing the ranges of resistivity, a lot of things were conductive. And so you need other information to make sure that you're interpreting those correctly. Um, here's an example of using gravity, magnetics, and MT together. And you can come up with a conceptual model using these as a joint interpretation. Um, another method is using, uh, well, yeah, using geological information. So using faults and you can also use seismicity to inform your interpretation of whether these faults are hydraulically conductive or not. And just show a video here of one example um, of imaging a geothermal system. So we'll be looking at the conductive bits of the system and how they connect to the surface. And this just a, showing the isosurface changing from conductive to resistive and back to conductive. And so that's just some eye candy of what we can do. And I'll just share an example from the geysers. Um, so the geysers is the world's largest geothermal field uh, in Northern California. It's a steam dominated field. And so with MT, we can image the different uh, regions of the geothermal field. So you can image the heat source, which is this red blob, well, the magmatic heat source. And then you can image the conductive heat source, which is this blue and lighter blue that uh, feeds the system. And then the steam field, which is the purple. And all this is controlled by uh, well data. So these surfaces uh, match pretty well with the MT as well. And the cool thing is, if you just look at the steam field, you can estimate a relative steam saturation from the resistivity. And if you do repeat measurements, you can see how the steam field is changing and inform uh, the drilling and extraction. Two minutes, Jared. Oh, right on. <laughs> well, uh, never short on words. <clears throat> so uh, the benefits of using MT to image geothermal is that it's extremely sensitive to the clay cap where uh, fluids get trapped. Uh, it's sensitive to hydraulically conductive faults, um, alteration, and it's also sensitive to where the heat sources are. So you, you can use MT to image the entire system, not just parts of it. And that's really important if you really want to understand why things are where they are. Um, we can also image the full geometry. So looking at the you know, full 3D image of a geothermal system, but you can't just use MT by itself. You need to use other information uh, to make informed interpretations. And you can also use MT to do time-lapse measurements. So monitoring, you know, steam field or geothermal injection or what have you. And that's it for me. Thanks very much, Jared. Um, so Justin, I know you had tracked a couple of those questions. I see those when they were asked on the, on the website for the workshop. Do you want to just repeat those? I think those are both for Chloe. That's right. Yeah, um, we can handle those, and then uh, if there's any more questions, we'll do those, and then move to the uh, talks from the Pascal team. Yeah. So these are both for Zoe, and the first one here is from Shenyang Zhao. Um, how long will the MT stations stay in Antarctica? So maybe you could just comment on kind of the duration of the typical MT deployments that you've been involved with down there. 
Yeah, so for the work that I showed about looking at groundwater, we were really interested in the upper few kilometers. So we only left our stations out uh, for about 24 hours. We would sometimes leave them out longer if there was too much wind that generated noise in our data. Uh, but for the kind of work that Phil has done, and Phil, chime in if I get this wrong, uh, they leave stations out for a week or multiple weeks, um, and you need to leave those out for that long to get that longer period data to sense deeper structures. Great. Okay, thanks, Chloe. And then just one other question, um, or maybe two more. Um, so this is from Alexis Richardson, and it says, uh, what modeling software was utilized for your groundwater models you developed? Uh, I didn't actually, we haven't done groundwater modeling yet. Uh, we just take our resistivity models and uh, kind of convert them to a groundwater salinity. So the images that I showed are just, um, the conceptual models are just from Illustrator. Okay, and, and it looks like we've got a uh, question here for Adam too. So Adam, I don't know if, if um, you'd be able to respond to this, but it sounds like Alexis is wondering um, what model and software you had used for, for the results that, that you presented. Oh yeah, good good point. And I actually meant to say that explicitly. Uh, we used ModEM, which was uh, has become kind of the academic community standard 3D uh, MT modeling system open source written by Gary Egbert, Anna Kelbert, and Nazar Megbel. Awesome, thanks. Oh, can I, sorry, I guess yeah. I should clarify uh, the like inversion software that I use, which is um, analogous to ModEM is Mare 2D EM, which is a 2D code, also open source uh, written by Carrie Key. Great. I think that's all the questions we have for now on the on the pathable chat window. But I'll keep my eye on that. Um, and yeah, if folks have questions as we're moving along. Feel free to type those in, and we will um, get around to to addressing those as we uh, as we move through the agenda. Excellent. So our next uh, our next speakers will be a trio uh, from the Pascal Instrument Center to talk uh, specifically about some of the resources that have been established for supporting. Uh, portable geophysical resource and especially MT related research. So uh, I will hand it off to the PIC team for uh, a series of short talks on different elements of their facility. And make sure we're unmuted. Great, thanks Andy. I um, guess I'll start, it looks like it's almost full screen there, but um, so those of you who have been to Socorro and New Mexico Tech, I just um, starting off with kind of a joke. I thought it'd be funny if, if, if uh, we changed the M mountain to MT mountain to celebrate the opening of the Pascal Magnetotelluric facility, but so I doubt New Mexico Tech will go for it, but maybe it's worth a try. Um, yeah, so the in terms of what we have at the PIC right now for instrumentation, we're actually uh, accumulating quite a bit of instrumentation. So we have 13 long period LEMI loggers, the LEMI 424s, and we have a relatively small, I guess, collection of electrodes, but still expanding. So we have 50 boron silver, silver electrodes should be enough to support our current instrumentation. And um, at the time this picture was taken, we only had two Phoenix wideband loggers and coils, but we've we now have six in-house and by the end of the year, we're gonna have actually 14. So we'll have a pretty good complement of both wideband and long period loggers for PIs to make use of. And so it's gonna briefly discuss the um, nomenclature that's usually used to identify the different instrument types. So Long period usually refers to the bandwidth below one hertz. And so that's, um, as Chloe and others referred to, that's dominantly the interaction of the solar wind with the Earth's magnetosphere it creates all this nice low energy, low frequency energy signals. And this is from a, a classical paper from Matsushita and Campbell from 1967 that shows their relative amplitudes 
And so you can see the rough one over F spectrum as the signals are getting bigger as you go lower in frequency and, and you can go all the way down to the 11 year cycle of the solar sunspot cycle. So the signals continue on lower and they also continue higher in frequency as well. But above one Hertz, it's mainly lightning discharges that is the um, source of the energy. And so long period is below one Hertz, almost exclusively the, the magnetospheric uh, source signals. Wideband is bandwidth is usually defined as a thousand seconds to a thousand Hertz. So it's a combination of both of those sources and the audio or AMT range is generally considered above one Hertz and up to 10 kilohertz in this case, or you, but you could go even higher than that, maybe 40 or 50 kilohertz even, there's signals up there. Um, so just in roughly in terms of what you can expect to achieve in terms of depth of investigation with the different methods or different instruments. So the audio is usually roughly the upper thousand meters typically under average conditions and the wideband instrumentation will usually get you in the depth range of somewhere around 200, 150 meters at the shallow end to 50 or 60 kilometers at the, on the deep end. And the long period, you might be more like in the range of five kilometers to 260 kilometers. So you know, this is very approximate, but something on those area, in that area. So in, in terms of um, imaging limitations though with, with MT, so, um, Isaac Nabigian, uh, 1979, um, introduced this smoke ring concept. So it kind of paints a, a nice picture, in my opinion, of what's happening in the earth as skin depth increases. If you can think of a smoke ring that's diffusing into the earth, because with magnetotelerics, we're dealing with diffusion, not propagation. It's a diffusive process. So it's like a smoke ring expanding downward and also outward as it goes. So as we go deeper and deeper, that smoke ring gets progressively larger and larger, and where our Earth response curves essentially represent a, a volume average. So as we get deeper, the volume that we're averaging over is getting bigger and bigger. So our resolution is decreasing as we go deeper. So that's one important um, note. And the second note is that um, with magnetotelerics, we're not really uh, generally getting we're not really getting anomalies due to induction in causative bodies itself. We're really dealing mainly with current channeling or what they call current gathering. So in that case, the anomalies are actually determined mainly by the, resist the ratio of the resistivity of the host to the anomalous body. So if you have a 50 to one contrast, um, you'll get a very similar anomaly, whether that's a, a 50 ohm meter host to a one, one ohm meter, uh, anomalous body or a 500 ohm meter host to a 10 ohm meter body, you'll get almost the exact same anomaly. So it's really that ratio that matters. So we're not actually dealing with induction typically in the causative body itself. And again, because of um, the scale of the source field, long strike length conductive targets are, are preferred as well. So. Um, so now in terms of the software that we have available at the, at the pick here with the instrumentation that we can loan out, we have the Lemmy 424 software, which is mainly a time series viewer, in my opinion. So it allows you to set up the gear in the field and you can take a look at the data as it's being collected and just make sure that everything's okay before you walk away from it and leave it for four weeks or whatever. So this is an example plot of 24 hours worth of data. So um, yeah, and there's some interesting looking stuff going on at around five in the morning. There looks like there's a, a, a nice event there. Um, so yeah, the Lemmy 424 software is mainly the time series viewer. And to process the Lemmy data, we also have the KMS 200 software, which um, is provided actually to PIs for a one year term. So if you rent out or you know, rent out, but if you uh, borrow the Lemmy equipment from us, then you have access to that KMS 200 software for one year after your experiments so that should give you enough time to process your data and play around with it and do whatever you need to do with it. And yeah. And for the wideband equipment, we have the, the really nice, uh, easy to use M-Power software that comes with the Phoenix equipment. So 
Um, it does a little bit more. It uh, you can set up your you configure the instrument within Empower before you start your survey. And you can obviously check the time series and the data quality um, as it's being collected. And then you can also process the data after the survey is over as well. And again, we have uh, quite a few licenses uh, here at the PIC with, of Empower, and we'll be providing those on our field laptops as well for the PIs to process their data with. And yeah, that's it for my first portion. Um, so when you're borrowing instrument from Pascal, you get various levels of support. So in terms of logistic, once your instrument request is flagged, the logistic team will be in touch with you to discuss the specific of your experiment, including the instrument type that you're requesting, the field dates, the potential scheduling conflicts. And the logistic team will also help you decide which instrument type you should request based on your, on your research needs and discuss whether you would need some auxiliary equipment based on the deployment length and power consumption. And the logistic team can also guide you through various aspects of a station installation, including if you need uh, how much time you would need, if you need help from uh, the Pascal staff, what are the recording consideration and so on and so forth. So once your experiment is funded, the logistic team will reach out to you to confirm dates and over detail. And at that point, the warehouse and logistic team will work with the PI to address the shipping needs. So estimate shipping costs, make sure that everything is properly packaged and as well as arranged shipping. It is worth noting that the cost of shipping Pascal equipment from to and from a field experiment is the responsibility of the institution that is requesting the equipment. So an accurate estimate of a shipping cost is really important because that will constitute a significant part of your project budget. And you can find more information regarding shipping under the following links. So in terms of training, Pascal offer three options currently. We have an in-person training at the Pascal Instrument Center. We have a Zoom training op option and we have a mixed mode. So the mixed mode is a combination of in-person training and Zoom training. When you're training virtually, so via Zoom, Pascal will send you a demo kit to allow you for some hands-on interaction. So at Pascal, we really believe that training is important for not only for the new PI, but also the more experienced PI, because it not only provides some hands-on interaction with the different type of instrumentation, software, and data handling tool that we supply, but it also provides you an opportunity to ask questions that you may not have thought to ask until you were in the field. And so training at Pascal usually is over roughly two days. It depends on your experiment. So during the first day, you usually have an overview of your experiment with the group here at Pascal. Then you discuss the logistic that you're proposing and you're reviewing the project instrumentation as well as uh, practicing a site installation. And during the second day, you are covering a station servicing and demobilization. And we're also presenting you the Pascal software for data and metadata handling, as well as introducing or reviewing the Pascal data and meta archiving procedures. So really during those two days, what you will be doing is you will be trained on the hardware that Pascal will provide for your experiment. So that include the data loggers, the sensors, the handheld controllers and the power system. You also be trained on the Pascal suite of software that we have here for data downloading to assess instrument health and data quality. And you will have some discussion regarding logistic site selection as well as installation techniques. So in terms of field support, um, Pascal will do its best to provide the requested support given the available resources that we have at the time of the field campaign. It's important to note that the PI does not pay for the PIC staff salary. It only pay for general expenses. And by general expenses, I mean transportation, meal and lodging. So in terms of uh, responsibility, the, the Pascal staff will be responsible of checking the shipment inventory, setting up the field lab to test the equipment and provide software and hardware training. The Pascal staff is also responsible to uh, for determining whether the instrument is actually functioning prior to the deployment and also helping in uh, station deployment. And so at 
the PAS, at the Pascal Instrument Center, we're also developing some field procedures as well as documentation to guide PI during their experiment. So these procedures come under the form of field sheet that lists each, each step in a typical station deployment, servicing, and demobilization, and also, also allow you from, to collect metadata. And we tell over this field sheet so that they are like specific to your experiment. And it is also specific to the equipment that you have borrowed. So in terms of software tools, uh, at Pascal, we're currently developing um, some tools that will allow the PI to easily collect empty metadata and archive the data and metadata collected from their experiment in the DMC. So one of those tools is lemme 2 seed which uh, offer a GUI framework to archive LEMI data and metadata in a standardized format. We'll also, we will also be developing other tools such as the Phoenix Reader, which allow the collection of additional film metadata, parse, allow also parsing the Phoenix data and converting the data and in, metadata into an archivable format. And finally, in terms of support, we also have support from um, the data group. So the data group routinely creates and updates documentations and tutorials on how to archive the data. So this document include information regarding archiving requirements, acceptable data formats, as well as data flows. A detailed Pascal documentation for archiving empty data will be coming up soon and will be posted uh, on our website. So the data group also offers some support and training to any users who need uh, assistance with using our software, as well as who have questions regarding our data, the data and metadata requirement for archiving. In terms of responsibility for data archiving, the PI is responsible for collecting uh, the proper metadata, as well as converting the data and metadata into an archivable format. And Pascal, on the other hand, is re responsible for training and providing support to the PI, as well as verifying the data and metadata consistency, applying some quality control checks, and sending the data and metadata to the DMC and confirming that all that data and metadata sent has been properly archived. Thank you, Maeva. Um, I will continue. Uh, um, so now that you know all ideas of how the MT system works and what we have, and then the, uh, what support we provide. Um, you can um, browse our website. There are a lot of detailed um, information of the type of instruments, our inventory um, of our uh, sensors, data loggers, uh, what's available at Pascal. Um, you can you can browse this information, and the uh, this is. This will include both the sense, seismic sensor and seismic equipment, and also the MT equipments. They're all on our website. Um, but uh, in order to actually make a request and um, ask uh, for instrumentation, you'll have to first uh, create a PI account. Um, you'll see those. Um, I put the links here for your future reference. Um, you can uh, pretty easy to browse our website. Um, once you create your user account, uh, uh, you will be uh, the PI of the experiment and you can request in instruments, you can choose what you want, you can um, uh, track and edit your existing requests or their, um, the, all, your, all your future experiments will also be there and you'll see all of them there. Uh, you can assign collaborators um, later on uh, in order to archive your data um, at DMC, uh, you would need to request a network code uh, which you can do that by mobilizing your experiments on their, um, your experiment page, which is accessible through your PI account. Um, um, once you uh, create your PI account and uh, made, made an instrument request, um, uh, you can um, always also contact our logistic group, which I put your, their email here um, for any other information that you may need, um, how many instruments, your time frame. Um, <clears throat> um, ancillary equipments, uh, etc. Uh, uh, our logistic team will be um, there to help you out. There's also a lot of information about um, our um, instrument use policies and government pol governing policies and the agreements that we would um, um, 
you have to make before using our instruments, such as when you borrow the instruments, you would also be responsible for archiving the data and making that available. So um, there are uh, um, information and more details on uh, the, our policies on the website as well. Um, uh, there are um, tons of information in addition to the instrument spec sheets and sensors and um, uh, such that there's also um, shipping information as Maeva mentioned and then um, there are also uh, other tools like the scheduling um, calendar and then power and memory calculation tools right now they're working for our seismic equipments but hopefully we'll get the MT details in there too. Um, so um, here are some screenshots of uh, our website on our uh, equipment inventory. Um, for example, here we have a list of data loggers um, on the left and the, some of the, I can't fit everything here, but um, they're listed there, the numbers of them, and then um, which um, category of our pool of instruments they belong to. Um, and then our empty, uh, data loggers and um, sensors are listed there as well, so you can browse. Um, there are, uh, once you, there's, um, in one of these pages, there's also links into the spec sheets and more details of these um, sensors and data loggers as well, which you can um, access uh, from our website as well. And um, yeah, here's a screenshot of um, how to create a PI account and some information about yourself and then um, um, filling in details to create that. Um, so I, I put the links um, for your convenience here. Um, yeah, once you once you create your PI account, you will have a PI homepage. Um, uh, your experiments will be listed here and um, you know there will be certain details here as well. Um, you can mobilize your project or view details or, you know, assign PIs and um, other uh, tools that are there that is, um, you would need to go to your PI homepage and then do certain things with your experiment. Um, when to request instruments, that's really important. Um, um, we, uh, our logistic group highly recommend you to um, request your instruments and make a PI account, go and request instruments. Um, way before uh, even you're funded. Um, uh, put that in our, um, that, that will help to come in into our system. Our logistic team will have an idea of what is the need uh, in the community or that specific PI, what you're needed. And then um, they can um, um, shuffle it in between experiments, even if you're not funded. And then um, your experiment will not be scheduled until it's funded. So, um, as soon as you're funded, you want to contact um, our logistic team so that you will be immediately um, scheduled and uh, your experiment would get a date. Um, so that, that's really, really important. And um, some of the, um, uh, most of the NSF programs require a support letter uh, if you're using the Gage Stage facility. Um, so they're under your uh, experiment page, um, you will have a, there's a checkbox that you would uh, mark to get your um, uh, NSF support letter and that will go through um, um, Justin and Kent and they will contact you uh, for more detail. Um, yeah, so I want to really emphasize, um, put your experiment in, um, create your experiment and put your, um, make a request way ahead of time, um, even before you're fund, even before you're funded so that our, um, We'll get we'll get a, a placeholder in our um, calendar, especially if they're really you know um, busy um, um, schedule. Then it would be um, it would be definitely better for our logistic groups to know. And as soon as you get funded, notify our logistic team. Um, Thanks, Akram. Um, so. Uh, just getting close to the end of our presentation, I was just going to go through a couple more slides of instrumentation related things. And so this is just a, a uh, kind of a slideshow, I guess, in a way of steps that we go through to set up an MT station. And the LEMI equipment is quite convenient and simple, easy to set up. 
uh, for a couple of reasons. The logger itself is very easy to use and the flux gate has all three components all in one nice little package. So here's the first slide at the top, uh, upper left is the equipment as a whole. And the first thing that I always do anyway is to orient yourself and pull out the electric field lines. Then the next step would be to dig, dig in the electrodes. And with the Lemmy, we like to install the electrodes with a bentonite ball just to preserve moisture and try to maintain the quality of the contact over time. You, you may or may not have to do that with a shorter wideband recording. If you're only recording for a day or two, you might get away with not doing that. But um, for the Lemmy, it's a good idea. And initially you install the flux gate just uh, roughly aligned with a hand compass to magnetic north though. So that's the thing that's a little bit different with the long period instruments is that we're using magnetic north, not true north with our, as our coordinate system, I guess, as our X axis for the coordinate system. Um, so after we do a rough alignment to the flux gate, then at the bottom left, then we would do a uh, check on the contact quality. And it's probably not a good idea to touch the leads like I'm doing. So that's an example of how not to do it. But um, after we do, after you check the contact quality, we can just plug everything into this um, electric field interface box, as I would call it. And it's essentially a lightning protection device um, in front of the logger. And it's also a good idea just to minimize potential problems for animals, whether they're tripping on them or chewing on the cables, is to bury the lines. And for the wideband equipment, sometimes it could be a good idea to do that as well to minimize uh, wind noise on the on the electric field lines due to um, motional EMF um, V cross V noise. So then, lastly, we would uh, just connect up everything to the logger, power it up, and once we power up the logger, then we can also do a, a fine scale alignment of the flux gate. So the goal here is to maximize the amount of uh, signal energy basically on the on the X component and minimize the amount on the Y. So once we get the Y component to something like 100 nanotesla or below, um, we'll typically like around Socorro anyways, see the X component might be something around 25 to 30,000 nanotesla. And the Y component, again, you want it to be let's say 50 nanotesla even or less. And if you've got it down to that level, then you can be quite confident that the, the flux gate is very well aligned to magnetic north. And, and that's it. So then you start the, start the recorder and come back in four weeks or however long you want to record for. And so that would be the, you know, the typical steps for the Lemmy. And in terms of the recording time, and this is talked about briefly already, so I'll just mention it quickly, but um, the typical long period bandwidth to get good data down to 10,000 seconds would be something like three or four weeks would be the recording time. And for the wideband equipment, um, to get good data to 1,000 seconds would usually be something in the range of two or three days. So the wideband deployments can be much faster, and you're obviously not going to get as low frequency or as deep into the, into the crust, but um, you can move along a lot quicker. And so showing it right in the picture here is the Phoenix system that we have at the pick. So it's the MTU 5C, so it's a five channel receiver. And shown here in the picture are the big MTC 150 induction coils. So they're almost one and a half meters long. They're pretty big, but uh, we also have available the shorter MTC 180 coils and those are just under a meter. And we're also working on procuring a bunch of Zong coils as well. So we're gonna be getting the, uh, the AT4s, which are a little bit smaller. They're 1.26 and meters, and they're also smaller diameter. So they're a little bit easier to handle. And, and the AT7s, hopefully they may even, um, if they work out, then those would be even better. They're just over a meter long and they appear to have just as good or even slightly better, I believe, noise properties than the AT4. So, that's what we're working on in terms of instrumentation. And I think Maeva has one more slide to finish off the talk. Uh, yes. Thank you, David. Um, so we're currently planning a pre-AGU MT workshop. So this workshop will most likely take place on the Sunday prior to the start of AGU. 
Obviously it's contingent to the COVID situation. And during that half day workshop, we are hoping to provide some ends on interaction with the Pascal MC instrument pool, including showing how to deploy and operate long period and wideband MT stations. And we're also hoping to introduce the different software tools that we have here at Pascal to monitor real-time data in the field and all empty data and metadata collection and archival, as well as processed data, including computing transfer function and doing one and 2D inversions. And finally, we're hoping to have a series of uh, short talks that will showcase existing empty research with an emphasis on joint seismic and empty work. And that's it for us. Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Maeva, David, and Akram. That was a great uh, overview of uh, how MT fits into the pick right now and how one could go about uh, getting instrumentation for their work. Um, I just wanted to, uh, there were a couple questions that have been accumulated and there was kind of a, a nice rolling dialogue in the chat relating to and kind of getting at the distinction between how field work for MT and seismic differ in terms of how many instruments need to be out at a given time. Um, I don't want to necessarily go through the entire chat now, but I think that's something that we could revisit in the panel discussion um, just to um, kind of highlight that a little bit. Um, and that was uh, in response to seeing the example of all the many stations that were deployed for IMUSH and seeing only a small initial pool of stations at, at the pick and that pool is growing, but, um, but the cut, the, the, to cut to the chase, the, um, you don't need to have all your stations out at the same time is sort of the takeaway. So um, I did want to acknowledge that there was a question from Heather Ford uh, yeah. about um, relating to the poll questions of using MT for educational purposes. What would the process for training and requesting the equipment be if it was used uh, for education? Would NSF funding still be required? I know this is something that Pascal um, uh, visits a lot with some of its instruments. So maybe someone from the PIC could weigh in there. So I'd be happy to take a first crack at it um, and just say that absolutely um, the, the uh, you know, as Andy mentioned, um, some of the equipment that we operate, some of the seismic equipment that we operate in particular, our multi-channel systems are uh, primarily used for educational uh, purposes. And many of those um, uses are not NSF funded in the sense that a, you know, a separate proposal or grant is written just for that purpose. Oftentimes um, PIs will just use university or department funds or something because they, they basically just have to cover the cost of shipping the equipment um, to and from Pascal. So certainly, um, you know, and, and I'm really glad for this question, Heather, because as you mentioned, um, the poll question about this shows that, you know, more than half of the people who responded said they would, had, had an interest in utilizing MT instruments for educational purposes. So that's, I think that's great to see. And I think that um, we're really hopeful that, um, that this new MT pool of equipment that is, is being developed at the PIC um, can see a lot of use in supporting educational purposes. Um, and like I said, you would not necessarily need to have a, a full NSF uh, proposal for that. You, you could follow the same process. I think it was Akram that was walking through the process of if you don't already have a PI account, setting one up on the Pascal website and then putting in your instant request via the website and working with the staff there on the the timing and whatnot um, to make sure that we can get that equipment to you in time for your class um, and, and along with the additional support that's provided in terms of uh, the data, um, processing the data and handling it and things like that. So if anyone from the PIC wants to chime in or add to that, please feel free. So, so Kent, Kent here. So I, I just wanted to add to that. There's also if, you, if you're doing an MT survey for the millionth time across campus, we don't necessarily have a requirement for uh, archiving that data as well. So that, that kind of lowers the barrier for educational purposes. Of course, if something cool jumps out at you, you're welcome to share the data at the DMC, but we wanna to try to make sure these, these instruments get out to as many people as possible and, and educate as many people as possible. I, I see that it's like we got another question too from Patricia, so Patricia, I don't know if you, if you are you able to unmute yourself? Um, if, if so, feel free to go ahead and ask your question. I am. Um, so yeah, I just had a general question. I, the conversation about uh, different wavelengths and different depths and how you set up your survey in the side of our chat was really interesting. And uh, forgive me, you already covered this, but I just had a general question on uh, what determines 
how uh, closely you space your instruments or your recordings um, in the horizontal sense. So you know, we talked about depth resolution, but what determines your horizontal resolution in, in those, uh, like in those maps of like of iMush where you had so many little dots. Um, is there like a rule of thumb? Is like a, like a half wavelength type thing or how does that work? Do you want me to address that since it's an iMush question? I could try. Um, this is actually something I was gonna mention in the panel. I think any, any successful proposal these days really requires some attention paid toward uh, testing models in advance and, and you know, uh, sensitivity analyses for different target scenarios. And so, uh, yeah, there are gonna be rules of thumb. I mean, we have a, a knowledge of our, our skin depth or depth of penetration vertically, assuming we have a constant conductivity half space of a certain resistivity or uh, absent any modeling. And that's gonna give you a rule of thumb, not only vertically, or, but as well as horizontally in terms of the minimum station spacing. But really to do it, to do it fully, you know, kind of would benefit from doing a full model run with modeling software to establish where to put your resources best and where, where you can maybe space out more broadly. Okay. Thanks, Adam. I'd like to chime in for uh, a moment there, not to sound facetious, but you should try to get as many sites as you can afford. Uh, the, upper, the upper crust can be complicated, uh, empty impedances, uh, since we're dealing with a very strong physical property contrast, can have quite a range of response. Uh, so you'd want to lay out the survey with enough lateral aperture to get your arms around the target depth and then you know fill in as you can afterwards. And all sorts of wonderful, unpredictable structures are going to show up that are going to add to the picture. All right, well, thank you for the answers. Thank you for the question, Patricia. Um, so I think we should continue to move on. We have one more speaker before we roll into panel. And that is Jennifer Wade from the National Science Foundation, who's going to give us uh, some perspective on uh, the landscape of uh, EAR and how MT fits into that. Thanks, Andy. I am going to share my screen. Okay, so uh, so yeah, I am Jen Wade. I'm a program director in the Division of Earth Sciences, and I'm just going to talk through a quick summary of sort of NSF structure and where I fit because I think there's a range of experiences here go over a couple of programs um, within mostly GEO that support MT. Um, and then I was sort of asked to really focus on the FRES program, the Frontier Research and Earth Sciences program, and give some general advice for proposal writing for that program, but also I think it's applicable to any proposal that you're writing to NSF. So this is just the NSF structure at the top. There's the director and the budget office and the sort of uh, we used to be in a separate building. It was like the lawyers and the budget people and then the scientists. <laughs> and the, the science directorates are divided up uh, by discipline, engineering, biological sciences, math, et cetera. And we are, of course, in the directorate for geosciences. And geosciences has four units, three divisions and an office. So there's earth sciences, ocean sciences, atmospheric and geospace, and then polar, which sort of covers all the other science just happens to occur in the Arctic or Antarctic. And um, within each division or office, there are a bunch of sections. And then within each section, there are a bunch of programs. I'm not going to go into the detail of that here, except to point out a few places where um, this kind of science that I've been listening to for the last hour has been supported. So in oceans, um, the marine geology and geophysics program, the MG&G program, has supported a good bit of offshore work. Um, in Polar, uh, the Antarctic Earth Sciences Program, you've heard a little bit of from that to, about that today, has supported some of this work. And I also wanted to point out this recent Dear Colleague letter that came out from the Office of Polar Programs about data reuse. So they're, you know, the last season and this upcoming season are, as many of you I'm sure know, severely curtailed in what field work we can do, but we're really trying to support work on data sets that have already been collected. Um, this goes for any part of, of GEO, really. It just happens to be that Polar also really put out a big call and a big push for proposals that might use data sets that were collected already, including MT, but everything, 
um, that you can work with now. And so I just wanted to throw a plug in to encourage people to submit um, proposals to that. They basically will come into the Antarctic Research Program under that Dear Colleague letter. And I can answer questions about that later. Most of what I'm going to talk about is EAR, the Division of Earth Sciences, because that's where I live. Um, programs that have supported MT work include within the disciplinary programs uh, section, of course, the geophysics program, also hydrologic sciences. And in integrated activities, uh, the geoinformatics program, formerly the geoprisms program, as you heard from Adam, RIP program is over. Um, and the Frontier Research and Earth Sciences program, or FRES. That is where I'm going to focus most of my efforts today, uh, is the, the FRES program. It's a relatively new program. It's only been around for about two years. So what is it? Um, it is the successor to a couple of other bigger programs that you might have heard of or been supported by Continental Dynamics and Integrated Earth Systems. So this is really an EAR-centric program, although we'll talk about co-review in a little bit. It funds large scale projects. So these are usually bigger than a million dollars. Most of them are interdisciplinary, but that's not required by the solicitation. And it really is intended to fund projects that are just too big for the core disciplinary programs to support. Uh, I also wanna acknowledge that I, am I don't manage the FRES program. I am here on behalf of my colleagues who couldn't be here. So Denny Geist is the lead, Maggie Benoit, I'm sure many of you know, Via this whole venue, um, Michael Kowalewski, who's a paleontologist, and Richard Juritich. So these are the this is the team that really manages FRES. That's the solicitation number. If you wanted to Google it, just go NSF 20-509 and you will find it. Um, and yeah, so that's sort of what is FRES. I want to take a minute um, to just step through the merit review process because we're going to talk about what makes a successful proposal, but you should understand. What that, how that proposal is going to be evaluated, right? So um, I'm not going to go too deep into this. I have a whole other webinars that talk just about this review process. But what happens is a proposal is going to come in. The next deadline for FRES is February 2nd of next year. It's going to undergo ad hoc review. So these are usually reviewers that are really close uh, experts in what you're proposing to do. It's going to go to a panel, which is going to be much broader, right? This is a panel that is looking at proposals from across all of Earth sciences in the FRES program. So physical volcanology, geophysics, uh, paleontology, genomics in the geobiology program, all of that. And then they a program director takes all of that input and makes a recommendation to either fund or decline a project. And this is just an example cover page for illustration on the right. This process really varies uh, across NSF, even within GEO, but this is the process for FRES. Um, they use both ad hoc and panel. So I just wanted to, to um, set this up because I think knowing that your proposal is going to be read by both ad hoc reviewers and a panel, it's important to make sure that you make your proposal accessible to both those experts and to the broader community, which we'll get back to in a second too. Okay, so some successful proposals, right? I said it's been two years since this program has been around. They've funded 14 projects. 100% of them have been multi-investigator. 100% of them have also had really creative and substantive broader impacts. 80% of them have involved international field work, which is interesting. And 100% of them have been multi-institutional. I, I mentioned earlier that they don't need to be multidisciplinary, but it happens to be that so far most of the, pro of the projects have been um, that have been funded and they cover all like a, the whole range of core programs. I just sort of listed out here what they relate to. So as you can see, it's it's a really broad program. Um, you can be really creative and explore a lot of boundaries in this space. It's always important to look at a solicitation before you submit to any program at NSF. And I just want to say a few things that are specific to the FRES solicitation. So here, this is just a screenshot of it. Solicitation is really useful because it tells you, is there a deadline or a target date or no deadline? FRES does, as I mentioned, have a deadline. This is different from all, most of the core programs in, in EAR. Gives you a synopsis of what the program wants to support. So do you belong in this program? Gives you who the program directors are. So who do you go to with questions? Talks about eligibility. So are you and or your institution eligible to even submit to this program? What are the budget limitations? And then what are the special requirements? And a lot of programs don't have them, but FRES sure does. So you wanna make sure that you're familiar 
with what is being asked in the solicitation before you submit a proposal. So some of them are, uh, there's a $3 million max, and this includes any research platforms and facilities. I've heard a lot of discussion today about what things cost, and you need to make sure that that's accounted for in your $3 million max when you're gonna submit to FRES. There's an 18 page project description. Um, so some of you may have submitted to the um, regular programs that have a 15 page limit. This is, gives you a little more space, right? Cause they're big projects. You also need to include a two page management and integration plan. So how are you going to manage this big scale project that you're proposing to do? And how are all the pieces and the people gonna integrate together? And then it also asks for three pages of um, prior support. You have a lot more room to talk about um, your results from prior, which is really useful. And panelists and reviewers pay a lot of attention to that. Uh, do they co-review with other parts of the agency? Absolutely. Um, the most common shares have been with the bio directorate, with ocean sciences, and with atmospheric and geospace. And there are some special requirements if you're using, say, a ship or um, part of NCAR or something like that. So you want to make sure, again, that you're looking at the solicitation to understand what those requirements are before you submit. So what makes a good project uh, in FRES? And I do think this, a lot of these go for, um, for many programs. So you want to ask important questions. Especially for FRES, this is a frontier research and earth sciences program. These should be game changing questions, big scale, with a real potential for scientific breakthrough. They should include visionary broader impacts. At this level of support, you should be really making a significant impact in the broader piece of society. I'm not going to, I have a whole separate talk I could give about what are broader impacts and, and what is the big range of what they could be and what could they include they could include. Um, and if you want to hear that, reach out to me anytime. Uh, it should be well integrated logistically and intellectually. Um, so the broader impacts should be well integrated into the rest of your project. And also the various pieces of that project should be integrated with each other and the people should be well integrated with each other. Hypothesis driven work does really well in FRES. And you should also acknowledge contingencies for when things go astray from what your hypothesis is. Um, and you want to have a real connection between what data you're collecting and the hypotheses you lay out. I will say that this is the most common mistake I see in any proposal in my 10 years at NSF is someone will lay out a set of hypotheses, spend 15 or 18 pages describing what they're going to do and never circle back to how those data are actually going to answer the questions they laid out at the beginning. It's such a simple, it sounds so simple, but it's really an extremely important connection to make sure that you make in a proposal. A strong team is really important. Do you work together well? Do you communicate? Do you have a plan for communicating? Again, this goes back to the integration. And then it needs to be compelling both to the specialists and to the wider community. And this is in, you know, in large part because of the merit review process. Will the experts trust that you know what you're doing? And will the wider community care at all? about what you're doing. I mentioned a lot of projects involve international work. Um, any money that's going to go to international individuals or organizations needs to be really clearly spelled out, explicitly identified, where's the money going um, and why. They should be substantive collaborations, so a real intellectual engagement um, if NSF funds are going to support that collaboration. And you want to make sure that if you need permission to uh, or permits to access a site or equipment that you have those in hand and those are included as part of your proposal. I just want to end with a little bit of general advice. Um, ask questions, please. We are here to help you be successful. We want to fund science. We want to fund good science and we want to help you uh, and your students do well. So reach out two program directors, we are here. Um, also, I spent most of this talking about FRES, but you maybe the project that you want to work on really is not appropriate for FRES. You fit somewhere else. Find your fit. So there's this little section of the NSF website. If you go to awards and go to search awards at the bottom of that white box there, you can type in keywords like magnetotelluric or anything else, a field, a field site, a geographic location, and it'll pull up all the awards that have been supported 
um, with that keyword either in the title or the abstract, you can look at what kind of work is being funded, who, who is funding it, which programs are funding it, how much money are people getting, you can see all of that. Um, volunteer to be a reviewer, if you have not already. The best way to learn when you're new to the system to, to try to understand how to, to write a proposal is to read other proposals. So reach out and let us know you want to review. Send your CV and say, hey, I'd love to be a reviewer, and we'll get you in the system. Um, you can sign up for emails from NSF uh, about new solicitations or guidance and changes, all that kind of stuff. And also EAR, OCE, and OPP all have regular newsletters that go out that you can sign. I put up our Earth Sciences page here. You can just go to the page of any of these divisions and sign up for those. I'm not sure Atmospheric has one, but I know that our, that those three do. Um, and I encourage you to get them. You'll, you'll get all kinds of news, new programs that might be coming up. It's, it's a useful listserv to be on. And lastly, you know, again, I sort of breezed past the merit review process here in the interest of time, because that's not the focus of this, but um, the NSF runs this uh, program called the NSF Grants Conference every year. In the last two years, it's been virtual, which is great because it means that all of the talks that usually we go and give in person that only a few hundred participants can see, everything is now online and free and you can watch it anytime. And I'm the rep for GEO, so you can listen to me talk at length about proposal preparation um, and proposal, you know, award management, all of that stuff. Um, if you just go to nsfpolicyoutreach.com, you can find all of these videos from this year and last year. And it's, I just think there's so much useful information that you can access readily. I think that's all I have, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Jen. Uh, any quick questions for Jen as we kind of pivot over to the panel? Um, and as, as people maybe think of those questions, I'll note that we have about, about 20 minutes left, technically 15, but we can go a little bit over, but obviously this is a two hour event and there's a break after it and I don't wanna cut into that too much. Um, but I would like to say as, um, as we kind of transition into the panel that we have four panelists, but there's a lot of expertise and thought in this room and so, you know, I think we'd like to open this up a little bit more that if there's a, a viewpoint that, uh, you know, either as an MT practitioner or a member of the facility you'd like to share as uh, a question's being addressed and feel free to, to chip in as well, um, the more the merrier. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, let's just take a look. Any, any questions to that? Not yet, okay. So, you know, with the panel, there's been a lot of information that's been provided. I really appreciate uh, all the speakers for taking the time to, to go into as much depth as you could and in a short amount of time to get information out there. Um, I think all of the speakers uh, would, would agree that if you anybody has any additional questions, uh, you know, please contact them. You can find their information either through the workshop website here or in an easy Google search. Um, but maybe just to start, uh, I think we'd be curious to hear from, from our panelists, so it's Adam, Ninfa, Peter, and Phil, um, any perspectives, there was a recent NSF um, or National Academies commissioned um, report, the CORES report, it's kind of known shorthand, uh, a vision for NSF Earth Sciences 2020 to 2030, Earth in Time, kind of a guiding document for um, you know big, big picture research approaches over the next decade. And I'd be curious to hear from our panelists just on, on what they think about how MT fits into that. How can it address some of those big questions? All right, uh, maybe I'll just start and others can join in. I, I actually see MT all over the CORES report if you, if you think about it. Um, for, for, you know, obviously we're not gonna answer what is an earthquake necessarily, but certainly, um, and Peter Scher is particularly expert at this, looking at the intersection between the kinds of uh, information you pull from say a resistivity model in a, in a high resolution wideband resistivity model and fault zone rupture. I mean, there's some, some very close overlaps there. Uh, when we look at uh, issues like uh, uh, what drives volcanism, again, MT is one of the primary methods one looks 
uh, uh, two, to look at uh, fluid distribution, including uh, melt uh, and hydrothermal systems. It's, so that's all over both geothermal and uh, volcanology questions. Um, there are issues that overlap with biogeochemical uh, cycles. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, maybe in the critical zone, uh, the instrumentation that the PIC currently has at the highest frequency level begins to get you toward the critical zone, but tends to be a little bit deeper than that. But certainly for deep biogeochemical cycling, uh, it's, it's certainly uh, appropriate. And, you know, geohazards. Um, for example, our, our biggest funding stream right now is coming from geohazards for, for my lab. And it was the unanticipated uh, interaction between the resistivity structure of the crust and mantle and how that impacts uh, risks to critical infrastructure from space weather. You know, so there, are, there it's like I say, all over the map. So I'll, I'll just kick off the discussion with those comments and, and pass the baton on. Uh, yeah, I'll offer a couple of points that uh, when we're looking at whole system uh, problems, the, the great bandwidth of the MT method uh, really allows you to present a source to sync interpretation of what's been going on. Uh, you have resolution possibilities that go from hundreds of kilometers to maybe even tens of meters. And so you can, you can follow uh, a magnetic source zone or even its uh, broader upper mantle fluxes by subduction systems, uh, then generating melts that enter the crust and, and then reach the surface through some kind of high angle zones. Uh, and as Adam alluded to, also one of the strengths of the method is uh, in addition to uh, broad uh, quasi tabular structures, it's very good at high angle structures. But sometimes uh, seismology has some uh, difficulties with. Uh, so we can see some good coupling between uh, large scale structures and steep zones that uh, present the egress of the elements to the near surface. I could speak a little bit to the more kind of interdisciplinary approach to using MT with something else. So as a volcano seismologist, I'm really interested in the hazard that a particular volcanic system represents. and Part of that is understanding the structure of magma storage and so part of it, a big part of it is understanding the composition of those melts because that's going to tell us about maybe the explosive nature or not of that system. Um, so uh, for example, velocity models are really good at really sensitive at getting at uh, temperature, the presence of melts, presence of fluids. I think the kind of extra step or kind of value add that you get by integrating MT is you can start to look at um, composition. So uh, rhyolites, say, versus more mafic materials are gonna have really different conductivity um, signatures. And so, so for me, putting the two together really grows my understanding of a volcanic system. Um, so that kind of threads into that CORES report. Um, I think one of them is on, uh, uh, excuse me, natural hazards. So. Yeah, if I could just add to, to all of that, and especially what Ninfa just said, um, focusing on, 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 on fault zones, uh, yeah, fault zones and earthquake hazards specifically, I mean, the, the empty and seismic overlap is, 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 is so good. A lot of times what we have is a, a fault system itself is, uh, you know, consists of damage and deformed structure. This is normally quite slow uh, material. And then as the people on this call, especially in the passive seismic realm know, um, you don't always have the best sensitivity to slow structure, especially if you work with uh, travel time data or any type of arrival time signals and seismology. Um, these tend to avoid um, the slowest material. However, on the other side, if you have some empty data, um, especially when the structure is conductive, it's fluid filled, etc., empty is going to be exceptionally sensitive to that exact structure. So it, it fits the definition of complementary um, to the T, and it's definitely something. Uh, worth considering in your science. Uh, the other thing, and I mentioned this in the chat, is the source field. Um, as a passive seismologist, you never choose where your source field is coming from, but the empty source field is everywhere. And it is, it is consistent. It's not always um, the same strength, but it's everywhere. You essentially have to just go out and measure it at the point of interest. Um, so yeah, complementary in, in many ways. 
And if I, if I could uh, also pipe in again to reinforce something Ninfa has, has said, uh, if, you, if you consider your experiment, uh, let's say a joint seismic MT petrologic experiment, you know, if you can bring in the geochemistry and the petrology, we found uh, you can really change the interpretation, right? You know, from any one of these methods alone, you just have too much uncertainty. Uh, and, and we've had a couple of examples where we've seen, you know, say, say a magma chamber that's been imaged from um, uh, the high lava plains experiment crossing Newbury volcano in Oregon is one example. This happened to be DOE funded in our case. We saw such a weak signature of the magma chamber in the MT data and knowing something about the geochemistry and petrology, we could actually constrain uh, the, the melt composition and, and its water content, which you couldn't do independently. So it's these complementary techniques that are really magnifying the power of each of the methods. Maybe just take an opportunity, would anybody else that's, uh, that's here like to weigh in on this just based on their experiences or, or thoughts relative to the CORES report? And then maybe we'll move to the next, uh, next question. Andy, maybe just taking a step back for a minute, in case folks aren't familiar, the CORES report, this is basically a report commissioned by the National Science Foundation to kind of outline the major questions in earth science in the next decade. Do I have that right? Or is there a better way to summarize kind of what this report's all about? That's, that's kind of the exact summary. Commissioned by the National Academies, I think, on, on behalf of NSF. Okay. Yeah, NSF paid for it, though. So we sort of commissioned it, managed by the academies. And everybody's calling it the Earth and Time Report now, just FYI. It's no longer course. Interesting question in the chat. Somebody may want to touch on from the tick. The Zoom chat. I can I can weigh in on that a little bit. You know, I think that some of the training that we've that we're we're thinking of proposing uh, and developing might involve uh, doing inversions. Um, a three D inversion for MT is is very computationally intensive and um, and takes I think some experience, but. There are, um, you know, 1D and 2D inversions, which can be, I think, very productively used. And there may be an opportunity to develop some some teaching and training materials uh, for that relative to the um, workshop that we're planning next year. And I think there may be some other efforts in the community to make uh, MT inversion software a little more user friendly or a little more um, maybe develop some additional training around those. But that's that's good input on you know understanding that there's a community need for new users to understand those sorts of resources. I think it's worth mentioning that NSF has supercomputing resources as well. So on that side, if you're not a facility that has that, but you get funded by NSF, that is an avenue for you to run those kind of computations. And if I just can add to that, at the peak, we would mostly help you, I mean, train you on using the instrument that you would be using in the field, as well as using the software tool to archive the data and do some quality check, but not really do the processing. So with the time we have left, maybe, um, maybe pivot to one more kind of uh, question for the the panel, I think uh, Chloe, if you want to go with that. Yeah, I think we just wanted to circle back to the earlier conversation that was happening in the chat about actually deploying MT receivers. And I think Nimfa, if you don't mind uh, heading us off, I think you had a nice, um, oh, with your experience, you have a good way of comparing like MT deployments compared to seismic deployments and just talking about the leapfrogging of MT instruments. Um, and then if anyone else wants to chime in just kind of about experiment design, um, that would be great. Um, sure, yeah. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't muted. Yeah, I've deployed, done these kind of co-deployments before. Um, I mean, they feel really similar between installing a seismic site and installing an MT site, lots of digging. Um, 
typically, I mean, I, I guess I, I don't exactly know what kind of detail you want here, but typically we'll run in a couple teams and have one team doing seismic installs and one team doing MT. Uh, typically for, you know, a single, you know, for the target we had at the time, we were running um, pretty similar kind of spacing. Um, we also, it also took really similar amounts of time to deploy a seismic site versus a temporary seismic site versus, um, you know, an MT site. So it, it works really well, I guess, is my, would be my takeaway message. Yeah. And then Adam, do you mind just repeating what you had typed in the chat? Um, just like earlier on about the rolling arrays of installations, because yeah. someone had asked a question about, well, it looks like there's only six instruments, like how am I going to do something like iMush with six instruments? So if you could just elaborate on Certainly, that. Yeah. Great. And I iMush is particularly ambitious, you know, where we had so many instruments and we're able to pool my, my own instrument pool with USGS. And we actually had a lot of field crew members as a result and a lot of capacity to do simultaneous instrument deployments. But in MT in general, you're doing rolling arrays of temporary installations. You're not waiting for earthquakes. You have a, as, as Peter has said, you have more or less a, a source that's everywhere. And even though the signal levels vary you know, from time to time, um, you can bet there'll be a signal. So you don't need the entire array deployed at once. So uh, the thing is, if you're doing wideband, in other words, high frequency, more fine resolution, your surface work, uh, your rolling arrays don't need to be on, on station very long. It can be less than a day or a couple of days. And so you have a finite capacity, depending on the number of field crew members you have, to even handle large numbers of instruments, right? You're just constantly gonna be moving them. So uh, even with say initially only six wide bands available at the pick, you can actually do fairly substantial arrays with that over time. Um, if you need more instruments, then there are ways of borrowing instruments from, from other entities uh, or, or you know, working it out. But in most experiments, you don't actually need vast numbers of instruments. Uh, simultaneously deployed. I'll just add a wrinkle about uh, polar projects, and that is the weather. Uh, and in that case, it's nice to have a large handful of instruments. Typically, we would try to get uh, 10 or 11 or 12 out at one time when you've got a sunny weather window, and then things will close in on you, and you just uh, let them tick away until the next time that you're able to get back at them and then move the whole family uh, again. I may have missed something. What are, what are the ranges of sample rates? I know I'm gonna do higher sample rate for the um, short period stuff, but what, what sort of ranges? Um, yeah, I mean, for long period work, you're typically um, around one sample a second, one to 10 samples a second, depending on the instrument is, is all you need. Uh, for wideband, uh, it depends on the particular instrument and the coils you're using and their frequent, frequency response. For the uh, Zong Zen instruments, uh, they, they tend to max out at uh, four kilohertz sample rates. Uh, the Phoenix systems can go higher. So it's actually quite a bit more data than a, a, a seismic experiment would, would tend to generate. You know, a 200 samples per second max is easily exceeded by lots and lots of wideband MT instruments. Thank you. Can I just note, I said this in the chat already, but in case folks didn't see it, if you're putting in instrument requests for these MT systems, uh, maybe don't necessarily focus on the number of systems we currently have, but think about the number of systems you need and put in the requests for that because we're always looking to try and track what's the actual demand on these things. Um, so we wanna really understand what the community needs. I'll, I'll add just on what Nympha said and said that, you know, we have a procurement plan on underway through the current award, um, but demand from the community will help that plan. And I think that will manifest in a facility that you know has more versatility for maybe multiple experiments at the same time or multiple large experiments at the same time. So, you know, demand drives uh, resources in a situation like this, or it can. I just want to note we have, we have a. Cool. 
Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Simon has a photo. Sorry. Yeah, a question. Yeah, I was just going to let Simon ask a Very question. Quick. Um, referring to this, the notion you don't have all your stations out at one time, it used to be people would obsess about remote references and static shift. Um, I haven't heard those words mentioned at all today. Uh, yes, remote referencing is still a key thing to do, Adam, uh, uh, Simon. Uh, even in remote areas uh, such as Antarctica, where things like wind noise can, can be a problem in, in your responses. So you still want to do that. Uh, we see with increased urbanization, large scale power systems are sending DC transmission lines at interstate uh, distances. These have a really uh, terrible effect on MT data. So ultra remote referencing is something that needs to uh, come into the mix. And when you mentioned static shifts, I sort of alluded to, you know, acquiring as many sites as you can because uh, the, the impedance uh, response to high contrasts and the static shift is a, is a particularly small scale in homogeneity effect. And, it, and it's something you, you sort of need to discover in your data set as you acquire it. Uh, some of the more advanced inversion codes can solve for the larger scale structure and site static effects at the same time. So uh, people have been getting a handle on, on these problems reasonably well. Right, so for, let's say you used all of the PIC6 widebands um, and it's a rolling array, uh, you're gonna have six simultaneous stations at any one time. So in any time window, you can find some combination of remote reference stations, as long as you factor that in, in into your array deployment schedule. So you have enough separation between at least one station and the remaining stations to do an effective remote reference. And for people who don't know what remote reference is, uh, you're trying to get rid of the biasing influences of uh, magnetic fields that are not uh, resulting from MT signals, but are other, other sources that may be uh, locally coherent. And so they'll cause a bias in your, your response, but are not broad scale coherent if you move some distance away. And so you can extract them and, and eliminate their biasing effects. And this is in a couple of frequency bands that have particularly low signal levels for various reasons. Uh, where the remote reference signal really can make a difference. I've got to run, folks. I'm afraid I'm going to have to break off from the panel because I've got a, so, another thing. Uh, I, um, somebody else can answer for you, Adam. Uh, <laughs> it sounds as though if you're using six stations and on a fairly local spacing, you know, if you want a dense sampling, you might choose experiment strategy where one of those stations is off on the other side of your field area while you're doing five local ones. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, exactly correct, Simon. So, um, so this has been a great dialogue, and I hate to cut it short, but I think the floor is going to turn to lava very, very soon in this room. So, uh, Kristen's reminding me of that. Yes. Uh, so, I think we should, I think we should wrap things up. But uh, you know, this has been a great dialogue. Uh, really appreciate uh, everyone that took time out of their meeting to uh, join this conversation, and I really also want to thank the 10 uh, you know, instructors or participants or contributors that put together talks and uh, delivered, I thought, a really uh, nice and uh, useful collection of information for, um, for learning how to use MT and kind of framing how you would approach that in your science. So I just wanted to say thank you to, to everyone who helped make this happen. And um, you know, if th this will not be the only event like this, uh, we are planning to have more community engagement it would help to hear if there's something that we didn't cover or questions that you'd like to have answered. Um, please, you know, contact me directly or uh, staff at the PIC or or your colleagues in the community that uh, that do this for a living. And uh, you know, this is uh, this effort over the last couple of years has been really driven by input from the community. And so we we hope to continue that and deliver resources in the CH facility that help your science. So I think with that, we'll wrap it up and and thank you all. And take care and uh, see you at the next session. Bye, Andy. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Thanks, Andy.